uh, three different things. To begin with, uh, different kinds of testing, real-world application and library testing. And I want to start with a big picture because I feel like a lot of conversations about testing are people talking past each other. One person advocates one method of testing, another person advocates another, and those are both valid methods just in different contexts. So it's good to know what you're talking about. And I'm mostly going to be focusing on library testing in the rest of my talk. Uh, so next section I'll be talking about ad hoc library testing. So starting out with you have a bug in your library, you want to fix it. How do you go from just fixing the bug to having a process that is actually well tested? And finally, after having built up from a bad process to a good process, I'm going to talk about test-driven development, which is one way, and I think a good way, but only one way of ensuring you have well-tested, correct software. And then I'll summarize what we've learned in the course of the talk. So let's start with the big picture. Imagine you're writing an application, uh, maybe a website. Your website has some users. Let's say you're a shopping, online shopping store. So you have sp your users have some expectations. They expect to be able to search for products, add them to their shopping cart, check out, give you a credit card, have the items shipped to their home. And as someone implementing this website, you want to make sure that the features your users care about actually work. So how do you do that? One thing you can do is simply rely on the fact that your users in the real world are using your software, real world testing. You don't have to do any upfront testing. You just wait for users to find a problem. When they find the problem, they report the problem to you. You fix it, and you solve the problem. And to some extent, real-world testing is unavoidable. If someone's using your website, they're going to find problems no matter what you did in advance. The problem is it's also expensive. If you are relying on your users to report all problems, there are going to be users who just give up and go to your competition, uh, and they might leave, in a ve leave being very unhappy. And even if they do report the bug, they've done it late enough in the development process that fixing problems might be very expensive. In the worst case, you may have to re-architect your whole system because of the problems you found. So ideally, you would minimize how much real-world testing you do and try to do some testing in advance. So the next step is, well, we have this application. We want to test it. And we want to, we're doing this testing on behalf of the users. We're trying to make sure that our application meets the user's needs. And so we want the way we're testing it, the application, to match the way the users interact with the application, because that's the best way to find things that actually impact users. And so we want to make realistic tests that match what users do, end-to-end -end tests. And so if, for example, we're building a website, this will involve having a web server with a database, same as in your production system, and then drive your tests with a browser. And that way, you'll be matching exactly the way that users interact with the real application. And you can do this manually, and you can do this in an automated way. And doing it in an automated way is cheaper, but it's going to miss some problems that manual testing is going to find. Like, automated tests can't tell you that your website looks weird or is hard to use. Uh, but maybe you want both. So you have these tests, and they make sure that your current features work. and when you add new features, you can run your old existing tests and make sure that your old features work. So is this enough? Do you need anything beyond this form of testing? We have less bugs. We have happy users. Do we need to do anything more? And it turns out there is something that can't be handled, that cannot be handled by application testing, and that is transformational change. So imagine that you're redoing your, the website's user interface from scratch. You have a completely new design. And this will happen every once in a while, you have to assume. And so you have these tests that you've made as realistic as possible. Like you've tried to make them match the way your application works. But that means if you change, and so they're testing your existing user interface as is. But if you're changing user interface, that means your tests no longer help you. Another problem you might have that counts as transformational change is you have this code in your application that might be reusable, and you want to use it in a different context. And again, if you take some code outside the context of your application, the tests you have that are tied to that original application don't help you. So application tests don't help you with transformational change. But that second problem also suggests a solution, which is 
starting to think in terms of applications and libraries. So as you're building your application, you're usually writing a bunch of custom logic specifically for what your application does. So you're specifically to your online web sorry, website, let's say. And over time, you start noticing commonalities, things that you're repeating, stuff that is more general than just your application. And that becomes a piece of code that stands on its own, a library. And if you have libraries, you can, that, if your application is built on top of libraries, then redoing your website from scratch might involve only redoing a very small layer. And yes, you're going to have to rewrite your test from scratch, but the part underneath isn't changing. And if you have libraries, you can take those libraries and use them to build new applications. And again, you, since you have a library, it works in a different context. So that suggests that we should be writing libraries as much as possible and minimize how much application code we have. We have a little bit of application code on top of a lot of a library code. And the library is our stable foundation that allows us to quickly build new applications and quickly redo the user interface or functionality of our application. What that means is we need to rely on our libraries. The libraries have to be a stable foundation. They have to work and continue to work correctly in order for, to allow us to change our applications. Which leads us to library testing. We want to test our libraries to ensure they work correctly. We're, unlike application testing, library testing is done for the benefit of developers. The audience for the library is the application, user, the application developer who will be using it, a programmer. M maybe you, maybe your coworkers, maybe someone in a different organization. We still want it to be realistic, though, and so we want to be testing the public API the way that the developers will be interacting with our library. We want to test it in, in a way that matches the way people interact with it. And again, you can do manual automated testing, but probably you're going to be doing, doing automated testing because it's code that you're a code API, and so testing it with code is the natural and easy thing to do. So that's the big picture, and we've arrived at some sense of library testing. And so next, let's actually see why the more specific details of testing a library. And we'll start with doing things the wrong way. We'll start with a bad process for fixing a bug, and we'll step by step try to improve things until we reach a good process. So imagine you have a library that lets you count the frequency of words within a string, or counts the frequency of words. Uh, and you get a bug report, and it says, I have this sentence, all for one, one for all. And when I check the count of the word all, uh, the count is wrong. So if you read the sentence, the word all appears twice. And so we expect the count for the word all to be two. So let's look at the code and see if we can figure out where the bug is. So if we stare at the code for a while and we see we initialize a default a dictionary that always has a default value of zero, we can add words and that increments the count by one after lower casing the word. And then we call and there's a function count that lets us check the count of uh, how many times a word appears. And eventually we'll notice that the count function, when we look up the, a word's count, we're not lower casing the word as we do when we add a word. And so if we check the count for an uppercase word, we're always going to get zero, no matter how many times we added it, because it's being stored in lowercase, but we're looking it up in whatever case we passed in. So the fix for this bug is just to add a lower to the word that we're, whose count we're checking. So this is the buggy code, and this is the fix code. Buggy, fixed. Problem solved, right? Well, as a programmer, it's good to cultivate paranoia. And partly that means not trusting others, although in a very friendly, nice way. But most of all, it means that you can't trust yourself. And so I don't trust myself. I do terrible things in code all the time. I write broken code. And so you have to have at the back of your head this little paranoid voice that's asking you questions about what you're doing. And the first question is, did that really fix the bug? Maybe I did. It looked like it was the right fix, but I'm not sure. So the way I solve that is by testing it. And I'm going to test it manually. So I'm going to start up the Python interpreter, import the class, add a word with one case, add a word with another case, look up the count for both of them, and I compare them, and they're the same. So that means I've fixed a bug. Sorry. 
OK, I fixed the bug. Great. No problem. But then I start feeling paranoid again. What if someone reintroduces the bug? Six months from now, I might change this code, and I might forget about this particular requirement about case sensitivity being an issue, and I might change the code in some way, and I might reintroduce the bug. So how do I ensure that six months from now, when I've completely forgotten about this bug report, that this problem doesn't occur again? And the solution is we'll write an automated test. Instead of having a test that is I manually hacked up and I type in an interpreter, I will have a module with all the tests in it. And then every time I make a change to the code, I can run the tests, all the tests, maybe me or maybe this automated system, continuous integration system. And that will ensure that any changes I make in the future won't reintroduce this bug. So I take the little test I wrote in an interpreter, and I add it to a test module. Uh, I'm using uh, tests in the style of the pi.test test runner. Uh, I don't use it much, but it makes things fit in slides better. Python has a built-in testing library, too. doesn't really matter. So I have this automated test. I can run it. The tests pass. Problem solved. Except. I've already noticed that sometimes I write buggy code. And I'm trying to get around this by writing a test, which is also code. And so what if my test is buggy? If my test is buggy, it may not be actually proving anything, and then I won't know if I've actually fixed the bug that I actually care about. And so what am I going to do about that? So the solution to that is we know we have a version of the code that had a bug in it. We got a bug report. Someone complained. We read the code. It seemed buggy. So if we run our test against that broken version of the code, the test should fail. And then in the fix, we know that it, it passes on the fixed version. But when we run against the, the buggy version, it should fail. And that will show us that the test transitioned from failing to passing, I've, thus demonstrating that I fixed the original bug and that my test is testing what I think it's doing, what, it's, what I think it's testing. So I take my old broken code, I run the test against it, and the test passes. So that means the test I've written that I thought was helping me demonstrate that my code was correct, that test was useless. So that's a problem. And it's a good thing I did this running a test against the old version of the code. But then I have another thing to worry about, which is I know there's a problem somewhere, but I don't know if it's my code or my test. And in this case, if you go and read the test carefully, you'll see the test is not correct. It's not actually testing what it should be, and it's e pretty easy to fix the test. But you can imagine a situation in the future where six months from now, me or worse, a colleague who's never seen this code are looking at a test and at some code, and the test and code disagree, or the test seems nonsensical, and they're not going to know which is correct, where the problem is. It's just going to be mysterious and hard to debug. And so the solution to this is a, what we would do for code in general, which is write a doc string. And the idea here is when you're writing a test, there's the actual implementation of how you wrote some code that does a certain set of steps. But there's also the intention of the test, what it's trying to demonstrate. And you write a doctrine that, that writes down what you intended to test, what you're trying to prove, what the requirement that you're trying to do is. And then later on, if you go back and you read the code for the test and the code makes no sense, at least you'll have the, the, the human, in human readable intention to guide you. Or if you have to rewrite this test because the API changed, the doc string for the test will tell you what the test is supposed to be proving that isn't tied to specific implementation details. So here's an updated test. It has a doc string explaining why we're doing this test. And it's important to make sure that, the, and I made sure here, that the doc string isn't just a re repeat of the code. The point is not to say the same thing of the code. The point is to write the intention. And if you run this particular test against the code, it will pass with a new fixed code, and it will fail with a broken code, as we expect. So now we have a test. It actually demonstrates what it's supposed to demonstrate. If we come back in six months, we'll know what the test was for. Great. 
But now we have our final moment of worry. I've just changed the code. In order to fix, this, fix the bug with a count function, I've had to change the, change the code. And anytime you change the code, you have to worry about breaking existing functionality. So how do I know that I didn't break existing functionality? And we kind of actually know the answer to this by this point, which is full test coverage. If we have tests for all public features of our library, then whenever we make a change, we can just run the full test suite and be confident that we haven't broken anything. So good thing all your code has tests for everything it does, right? Well, in practice, you will often have lots of code that doesn't have tests. It's old code, uh, code you've inherited. So what you do in that case is you add tests as you go along. You might be tempted instead to make just the minimal change sufficient to fix whatever problem you're doing and just touch as little as possible and not actually make bigger changes that might break things. But the problem there is you end up with code that becomes more and more brittle and more and more tied to specific functionality. And you end up copy pasting code and your code quickly becomes even less maintainable than it was before. So what you want to do is every time you touch a piece of code, if it doesn't have any tests, write a couple. Over time, test coverage will improve. And there's a very useful book on the topic called Working Effectively with Legacy Code, where legacy code is a euphemism for code that doesn't have tests. If you're doing new feature development, then you should be writing tests for all new features that you write. And those tests will demonstrate that those new features are actually doing what you expect them to do. And later on, you can run those tests and make sure you haven't broken that functionality when you make changes in the future. So we've started from this bad process of just fixing a bug and hoping. And we've gone a lot further. But we've been doing this sort of an ad hoc manner. So maybe we can do better than that. Instead of being having to worry continuously as we write code, if we can encode what we've learned into a pr development process in a way that it just becomes automatic, becomes habit, then we won't have to worry as much. And we'll just be able to focus on the coding, and the process will make sure things happen correctly. And the five things we've learned is you should be testing your code. You should be doing this automatically, and every time you make a change. Your tests should be going from failing to passing to prove that they're actually doing what testing what you think they're testing. You should document your test's goal in case you make a mistake or have to change your test later on. And you should be testing all of your code if at all possible. If you can't, you can't. And test-driven development is one process that meets all of those requirements. There are other processes you can do that will achieve the same goals. But this is the one that I like, so this is the one I'm talking about today. So in test-driven development, you have some software and have some requirements. And you start by encoding those requirements in tests. And those tests should fail. So the first thing you're doing is you're writing your tests. You then write code that, makes, that meets the specification. And you know that you're done writing the code when all your tests pass. So you start with your tests, write some code. And those co that code makes the tests pass. And bug fixing, uh, we've, which is what we've been talking about so far, it's more or less the process we've been talking about. Um, so we write a test, write a doc string for the test. We run the test. We should expect it to fail. And this is a useful step because part of what you're doing when you're writing the test is nailing down what exactly the bug it is that you're fixing is. Because it may turn out that your bug report was actually three different bugs, or you may have found an unrelated bug. And so having that initially failing test is a way to encode your understanding of what the problem is. Then you fix the code, and now your test should pass. And your test should have a doctrine. And so having talked about bug fixes, we can then think about feature development and how we might do that in a test-driven development, using test-driven development. And so the way I like to do it is I start with some exploratory design. I, once I've sort of nailed down the design, I know more or less what I think it's going to look like. I come up with some more detailed requirements for the code. And then we do the 
test-driven development loop. We write a test, make sure it fails, write the code. Once a test passes, we know that requirement is met. And once all of our requirements are tested and the tests all pass, we know that our development is done. So let's take that step by step. And we're going to add a feature to the word counting class that we saw earlier. So in the first version of the word counting class, you can add words and you can get the count of an individual word. So the original bug report was someone looking up the count of the word all. But there's no good way in, our, in the class to see the counts for all the words. So we want some way to get accounts for all the words that we've added to the word count class. And from the exploratory design, uh, we write a couple of different or more ways of interaction, interactions that might satisfy this particular feature that we want. So we have a class, we add two words from it. Uh, one way we could do this is we say, give me a list of all the words that have been added to you. And then you can iterate over those and look up the count individually. And another thing we can do is, another alternative is we could ask for, get back a dictionary or mapping of some sort that maps between words and their accounts. These are the two API, des API designs. Depending what you're doing, you might want to do one or the other. There are different trade-offs. Uh, I'm arbitrarily going to pick the second one. And so the next thing we do is uh, add the new methods that we've de decided to add as stubs to our actual implementation. They don't have, there's no function body. The function doesn't do anything, but we've added the function and we've written a doc string saying what we expect the function to do. And this is an additional step in the design process because it lets us see what the code would actually look like more, sort of a skeletal level if we added this method in this class. But it also means when we write failing tests, the failing tests will fail in a more meaningful way. They might, they're not going to fail with an, hopefully with an attribute error or an import error. They might fail slightly more meaningfully. Not great, but a little better. And so next, having come up with, chosen a design, we're going to write down the requirements. And when I say write, you might just uh, put the, you might do this in your head. I don't actually actively always write them down, but sometimes it's useful to write them down if you're dealing with a more complex uh, set design that you're building. And there's a few categories of requirements that we're doing here. One is just the plain functionality. What is this new function, what is this new method that we add going to do? And in this case, it's going to return a dictionary that maps lowercase counted words to their counts. And lowercase was not in our original design. Uh, it's just as we start writing on more detailed requirements, we start having to think through all the implications of this API's design. And maybe at this point, you're going to say, oh, this makes no sense. I'm going to go back to the drawing board. So every step along the way is an opportunity to improve your design. So beyond basic functionality, we also have to think about edge cases, uh, things along the boundaries of the API interaction, because these are places where you're more likely to have some sort of failure, where something might go wrong. So in this case, if you have added no words, we expect to get back an empty dictionary. And we also look for places where the API might be ambiguous, where it's not quite clear what the implications of what you're doing are. And in this case, since we're returning a dictionary, and the implementation kind of is a dictionary, we want to make sure that if we modify whatever got returned from this method, it's not going to change the internals of the original object. So we want to basically make sure there's no possible side effects from this particular interaction. And all of these uh, requirements have, again, enhanced our design, and we have a much better sense of what it is that we're building. So the next step is to add a new test and write a doc string. And this doc string, in this case, can just be one of the requirements we wrote. You can just take that requirement you've written down, and now you have a doc string for your test. Often you'll find that you have to write multiple tests per, for requirements, but um, in this case, we didn't. We implement the test. Um, and when you're writing this test, you are interacting with a new API that you're building. And so this is another opportunity to test your design. And if you find that writing this test is extremely awkward, maybe your new proposed API, your new feature is also extremely awkward, and maybe you have to redesign things. So writing the test is another place where you're going to be refining your design and learning how to improve it. So we write the test, proving that 
When you call all counts, we get back a dictionary with the results we expect. We run the test. As expected, the, new, the previous test I wrote passes, and the new test fails. Now, I implement that particular requirement. And in this case, implementing the requirement is as easy as returning the internal dictionary that we're using as part of the implementation. And while it makes this test pass, this particular implementation is going to fail our, a future test we're going to write about changing to the result of this function not mutating the internals of the class. That's fine. We're just incrementally building things up. And we run the tests. And as expected, our new our the new test we've written passes now. And now we just repeat the process. We implement a test for the next requirement, run it, make sure it fails. We write the actual code, run the tests. They should pass now. If they don't pass, maybe our code is buggy, maybe our test is buggy. Figure out. And then we move on to the next requirement. And eventually, after all of our requirements have, have passing tests, we will have a implementation that meets all the requirements and it is fully tested. And one important thing to keep in mind is you want to be testing the public API. If you test private implementation details, for example, an, uh, an internal dictionary that has an underscore convention for private, that means you are going to have tests that fail spuriously whenever someone changes internal implementation. The fact that the internal implementation of word count is irrelevant to the person who's using this API. And that you shouldn't have tests that fail when you've changed irrelevant details. And one of the implications is, is you should also try to make your public API as small as possible. And since in Python this is done only by convention, having an underscore at the beginning of this attribute, of the words attribute, is a good way to document for your users that they shouldn't be using it. And if, if it's documented they shouldn't be using it, you also know you don't really have to test it, which means you have to write less tests, and you can constrain yourself less when you change implementation in the future. So let's go over what we've covered in this talk. What kinds of testing are there? There's real-world testing when someone actually uses your software in the real world, and if you're lucky, reports a bug. You should make it as easy as possible for them to report bugs. Uh, there's application testing, where you're testing your application features on behalf of your users, and you want to make those tests as realistic as possible. And there's library testing, where you're testing library code, and you want to do that via a public API, and you're doing the library testing on behalf of developers. Test-driven development is a process where you encode your requirements in tests. Those tests should fail. You write code that meets a specification, and the tests go from failing to passing. And you can actually use, I've only talked about library testing mostly in this talk, but you can use test-driven development with application testing as well. And uh, it's usually called behavior-driven development. Uh, it has some additional implications about what it means, but it's the same process. So test-driven development can be used in other contexts in library testing as well. Why should we test? Uh, it helps us ensure that our current requirements are actually correct, or that we fix the bug. By accumulating tests over time, when we change things in the future, we can ensure we haven't broken existing functionality. And by testing our libraries, we have a stable foundation that allows applications to go through transformational change without having to rebuild everything from from zero, you actually have to only redo a nar much narrower and smaller part of the application. And why should you test first, which is what test-driven development suggests? Testing first means you only write new code when you have tests for it, and so you're getting full test coverage as a side effect of your process. Uh, it makes sure that your tests do what you test what you think you're testing. You don't end up with tests that prove nothing. And if you're building a library, test-driven development helps you with the design process of new features because it means you're trying out the API as you're writing it rather than building a whole thing and then trying the API and realizing after you've done it that actually this API is problematic or you've missed a feature. And you can get all of these benefits without testing first, but 
I find that after, with a little practice, test-driven development is a really useful and uh, easy to, it, given the practice, it's actually much easier than it seems than, that at first pass. Um, finally, I'm trying to write a book about software testing. Uh, you can, there's one chapter online now. You can sign up for Malice and I will send you an email if you want to know about future chapters. The slides are available up on my website as well. And I'd like to thank the photographers who took these images and released them under the Creative Commons license. Thank you. So, we have about 10 minutes for questions. There's a microphone over there in the aisle and over here in the aisle. So if you have a question for Itamar, uh, please just uh, line up and uh, we'll see what we can find. Uh, yeah, first question. Um, so, uh, great talk, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add something to this. So. You mentioned all these things about writing these tests, but uh, and this is for a library. But what if somebody's already written some tests and then you're going to go add something to the library? So I just wanted to add that you should first try running the existing test to make sure that you haven't broken some code, and then start designing your tests, and then run your test to see if they failed, and then write the feature. So I, I'm just trying to throw caution to the wind here. If, if somebody already has a list of tests that are written against a library, if that, that we should also honor that. Yeah, I mean, the, great ben the greatest benefit of automated tests is not at the point when you're actually writing them. It's later on when you're modifying your code. That is when the greatest benefit comes, when you're able to run the test later and actually ensure that your changes haven't broken anything. So the in, there, there's the initial benefit, but there's also initial cost, but the benefits extend over time, and that requires you to run those tests, yes. So, and an another question is, uh, in my organization, I, have, I seem to have a slight problem with some developers who are averse to this methodology. They don't want to write tests. They just want to keep writing code because they think it slows them down. So do you have any advice for me to talk to them about this? Anybody else the, face that problem? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, partly this is a management issue, the incentives that uh, like the organization gives you. Because if your organization rewards you for writing as much code as possible, not for writing maintainable code, then you'll, you'll have that effect. Uh, but if it's... I guess it depends what your application is and what the costs of failure are and how much time you have to spend maintaining code later on and dealing with brokenness. I, I'm not sure, beyond a certain point, I think it's the organization. If the organization cares about quality, it has to have requirements for developers. Oh, I agree. Okay. There's tremendous value in this. It's just that I wanted to say that it, not everybody's following it and I'm, I'm trying to get people to follow it, that's all. Thanks. Next question, please. Actually, uh, I will g give one reason that I find tests that might help with some people, which is if you have really good test coverage, you can make massive changes to the code and not have to worry about breaking something. And that actually speeds things up. When, when you have to deal with sufficiently large change, if you don't have tests, you have this worry, I'm going to break everything. If you have good enough tests, you can actually make really, really big changes and just do it with no fear at all because we know the tests are there to make sure that things will work at the end of it. So that might help. Next question. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. I definitely learned some things that uh, I can put to use. But uh, one of my challenges is I'm very guilty of writing some tests initially and then forgetting about them and not running them and winding up with a mess that I can't go back and test. Uh, Partially because as I get beyond the contrived, oh, here's my class interface, um, I s have some trouble kind of identifying these patterns or code smells essentially to uh, that testing would possibly address. So I was wondering if there was a source or an existing well-tested Python project it, you could point me to that would kind of show how one can design these tests for s complex interactions and 
and such. Um, so there, there was one comment about forgetting to run the tests and the other about uh, how to test complex things. So for forgetting to run the tests, the, a good way to deal with that is automation because software is good at not forgetting things. Uh, and so like, you can have systems that run your tests automatically on every check-in or every pull request depending on your system, uh, some of which are free. Uh, and so once you have, like if you're on GitHub, you can use Travis CI for open source projects. And then every time you do a pull request, it'll tell you if your tests are failing or passing. And then at least you'll know that you've broken something. In terms of complex systems, uh, the idea, beyond a certain point, you are dealing with your the right t testing becomes a piece of software and then it has all the same issues that you have with writing large pieces of software. And the way you solve that with regular software is you try to have layers of abstraction. And so you try to say, once I've tested this layer, I know it just works and I can trust it. And then you can build on top of it. And so at each point, you only have to think about one layer and you have to think about layers above or below. And there's also, and sometimes you have the problem that the layer below is something you don't actually want to call into. It's like it's calling out to, the, to an external system. So at work, we interact with Docker. And so we, don't, we have a Docker client, but we don't want to have our tests actually interacting with Docker. And so what we do is we have a Docker client, and then we have a, doc, a, a, a class that looks just like it, which is for testing purposes. And we have a set of tests that we run against both the real client and the testing client. And so we have one set of, so those tests prove that those two objects behave the same way. And then later we can use the fake one for all of our tests, knowing that the, because we've previously proved that the interactions between the real one and the fake one are the same, we can use the fake one in a test and know that it'll actually work in, the, in a real system. Thank you. Yeah, from over here. Um, you just basically answered my question. Uh, how do you test things like I.O. Um, that you ne don't necessarily want to do during the unit test? Yeah, so it may be that doing, depending what you're doing, it may be that doing the I.O. is fine. Uh, there are some definitions of testing that strongly want you to have everything in memory, and I think that's a nice property to have, but depending on your goals, it may be a waste of time. But sometimes there's, there, there are interactions with external systems that you really don't want to have running in all of your tests. And as I said, the way you do that is you have, sorry, you have a series of tests for that particular thing that interacts with an external system. And those tests may only be able to, maybe you can't run them on a developer desktop. Maybe they can only run in your automated build system. But someone somewhere is writing them regularly. And then you have a series of interface tests that you run against that real object and the fake. And now you have a verified fake that you know behaves the same as the real one from the external API's point of view. And then you can swap it out in your tests. Okay, uh, over here. Hi there. Um, do you have any recommendations for managing the coupling between requirements and their associated code and tests? In the case where the requirements may live well outside of a doc string, coming from another organization, and could change based on customer requests and such, and trying to manage that, okay, now the code's out of date, but what tests were previously testing those requirements, that sort of thing. Yeah, so I mentioned behavior-driven development, uh, and behavior-driven development uh, tries, is a much higher level form of testing. It's on the application level, and it's designed for this problem of we have requirements that are coming from non-programmers who want to maintain the requirements, and then, but we want to run them in an automated manner. And the way they solve that is they have tools where you have this sort of mini language that is high level enough that non-programmers can at least read it, or maybe even write it. And so you say something like, when this is true, and this is true, and this happens, this result happens. But it's an instructor such that a human being can read it and understand it if they're a domain like logic expert. And you can read it in a, in a program and convert it into an automated test. 
So in behavior-driven development, you'll have a tool chain for parsing these, this MIDI language, and then you're, you, you will write the infrastructure to turn whatever data structure you loaded into an automated test. And then your domain logic experts can both can write these, or at very minimum, they can read it and say, oh, this test is not doing what I want it to. OK, thank you. Cool. And we'll make this the last question. Hi, thanks for giving this talk. I'd like to know if you know of an open source project that you'd recommend that has a, is a, an exemplar for doing these tests, especially if it involved PyTest. Uh, I'm not sure I've. Which libraries use PyTest? Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm, I'm not totally attached to PyTest. I, I really like it. But I, I would like to be able to have like a, an open source project that could go through and see like, oh, these guys are, are really showing us this is how it should be done uh, and so structured. Um, the project I work on at work is uh, open source and that's it, twisted. It, it, yeah. Uh, no. I, I mean, twisted has like a lots of legacy code where tests are sort of iffy. But the like the example I gave of the verified fake with Docker client is in a work project that is open source, um, and we're trying to have like from unit tests up to functional tests interacting with the syst like real systems and then end to end acceptance tests, and trying to do full test coverage, uh, pretty much from day one. Um, and since it's something I'm working on, it sort of expresses the mine and my colleagues' best understanding of how to test, which we learn, we, we continuously learn over time, um, to the point where because we're building a complex distributed system, the logging we get out of the system is going to be extremely important in debugging problems going forward. And so we're trying to do just enough testing of the log messages themselves that we know they're actually going to come out right. Um, and so the project is, if you go to clusterhq.com, the project's name is Flocker, F-L-O-C-K-E-R. And great, thank it's you. on GitHub. Uh, great. Well, that's all the time we have. So everybody, please thank Itamar for a fantastic talk on test-driven development. Uh, and if anyone wants to talk to me further, I'll go stand over there or something. Uh, great, so uh, lunch is downstairs, uh, you should get to that. Thanks for coming. <laughs>